It's May 17th, 2021. This is Rook. Just how much do you savor your panita and kebab? Dr. Angie has some words for you. She's an Iranian-American medical doctor who specializes in gastroenterology and the digestive system, but she is growing an international profile as one of the sharpest advocates for a plant-based diet. Dr. Angie Sadri says she turned her life around with switching to vegetarianism in 2005, later eliminating dairy as well. And now she's not just a popular practicing doctor and athlete, but a big presence in social media where she spreads her health gospel. Dr. Angie Sadri joins us for a feature interview coming up. Plus, we have your letters. This is stories from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 111 of Rook. Salam dostan aziz, o mivar hastam ke mizun bashin. The sun is shining this week in Toronto, finally. Hello to everyone around the globe listening in. We are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity coming to you on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, CastBox, and Telegram. You like the fact that the sun is shining and it's warm out? Finally, June? it's like summer has finally arrived. I mean, Not e- quite. Even but. with all the heartache happening around the world, a, a fresh sunny day oh, gives you hope. All the difference. You know? It does. I woke up and looked outside and thought, Hamas <laughs> Karanot. <laughs> Hamas nice Karanot. Yeah, right. You know? So. Because, uh, yeah, and you just feel healthier. Yeah. It's like those people in LA, our friends listening in Los Angeles right now, they walk around looking good, feeling good about themselves. It's because they live in sunshine. Exactly. You know, it would be easier to be a vegan if we lived in LA, I think. Mm, nice segue. <laughs> exactly. Dr. Angie Sadiri coming up. You know, a lot of people are going to love this guest. If they do not already, if you don't already know Dr. Angie Sadiri, you're in for a treat. I think she's fantastic. Uh, she's a great presence in social media. She's she's very friendly and accessible in the way she, she's not a preacher necessarily, but she is passionate about uh, being outspoken when it comes to plant-based diets and not consuming dairy. Uh, and that said, I mean, she's also therefore possibly controversial. Mm. Uh, <laughs> if you're an Iranian who does not want to give up your milk and meat, look out. We may even have some people on our team who have claimed that they don't agree with Dr. Angie's studies, you know, questioning whether she's a doctor, or, you know. Listen, it's hard to let go of kebab life, man. You know, uh, I'll, I'll put that to her. We'll get to Dr. Angie Sadiri joining us from uh, Newport Beach, California. Lucky her in just a few moments. Uh, if you like what you hear on this show regularly, folks, uh, we do this through crowdfunding. Become a patron of Rook. You go to our website, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com, R-O-Q-E, as you know, and just press support us at the top there. And for five or 10 bucks a month, you become a patron. We see people adding to the list and we get happy. And also, whatever platform you're on, you can also subscribe. which is uh, easy to do. Just press the subscribe button and uh, that helps us as well. We keep in touch with you, therefore. Uh, Hello, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. How are you, sir? I'm great. Uh, Fantastic. Oh, Oh, you're fantastic. I am fantastic. Uh And uh, he's looking more and more like LeBron James. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, will you him. ever shave this beard? It no, just keeps I, on. I, I don't know. I got to ask uh, for permission to do that. He's right. a different yeah. person every week. It's like mm. a completely different the, entity. The, yeah, because yeah. it keeps growing. 
the beard. Yes. You know? Well, <laughs> you look like uh, the, the statues of the, our great poets that are going up at Quiche Island. <laughs> I wouldn't you, go that you know, far, no. He's, I'd uh, say more of the terrorist look for him. Shia, on the other hand, he looks like a philosopher. <laughs> he does look like a poet, that's yeah. for sure. Shia, though he just <laughs> becomes more and more of a philosopher each week. <laughs> Hello, Shai Jun. Hi, Azza. How are you? How are you? Oh, that was touching. Love it. You know, let me tell you about Shia. Let me tell tell you the difference. Let me tell you the difference between Shia and Reza. Can't wait for this one. Because you know, last week we didn't do our clubhouse. No. This Friday we'll be back on Clubhouse. We'll do a a Rook Town Hall uh, this Friday night. So if you if you've just joined Clubhouse, because I I know there's a a bunch of people who've just joined because of Android now is allowed. So uh, or you know uh, whatever it's become accessible to Android users. So if you've just joined and you or if you're already on Clubhouse. And you can find us at Rook Media. You can be part of our club there. But uh, and find all of us. We're on Clubhouse, and we and Friday nights or Friday nights Toronto time. That is uh, eight p.m. We do a Rook Town Hall where we talk about topics that come up throughout the week. So anyway, last week we didn't do one. Now Captain Reza, you know he. <laughs> He doesn't, if he's not going to come, he doesn't even say anything, right? No. And then so afterwards, weird. you're like, dude, where were you? Yeah. Mm, it's I like was, we uh, wait for him, too. We're, uh, we're my dog there. ate the homework. Like, he has some lazy, <laughs> you know, lame old excuse, you know. Uh, I had to go up to Newmarket to pick up, uh, you know, and it's like, <laughs> all right, sure. And then, but Shia, Shia is so sweet, uh, you know. So Shia comes to me on, on Friday, I don't know, it was Thursday or Friday last week, before he knew that we were, we were not going to do the, co- and he's like, I, the sweetest guy. You know, I, I have some bad news. Oh, no, I, my. I have, uh, um, I have, the bad news. You know, and I was like, what, what happened? Are you okay? You know, uh, I don't. Mm. Holy! <laughs> 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 there's, a, there's more swallowing when he's stressed out. Uh, uh, Stressing I, I, out. Mm. Uh, I I may not be able to come for a clubhouse, you know. And I was like, I wanted to almost play along and go, what, you know. And then I was like, we don't have it this week. I was like, and he was like, oh, okay, you know. But he was so sweet. He was like coming pre-warning, like at the rather, you know. I was like. We get, we don't find out till we're in clubhouse waiting. By the way, later. you don't even know this. We've waited a couple of weeks. Yeah. Like we oh, have we hundreds of people sitting there in clubhouse. We we haven't started because I'm like, well, Reza should be here any moment, and you never turn <laughs> yeah. up. Oh man! So we just no, start. but I texted you the, the other day though. It was like Friday. All I 8, know is that afterwards, and 10. then you have the worst reasons. <laughs> mm, my tire wouldn't work. It's like you don't have to drive anywhere, Reza. It's clubhouse. It's on a phone. You know, wouldn't work. <laughs> That doesn't even make sense. Yeah, exactly. That's my problem. It's that it's that Pfizer uh, thing that's gotten oh, into man, your brain. It's kicking in. That uh, perfect vaccine that you got. I had more uh, family members, the same ones that were so encouraging of me getting the AstraZeneca. The, the 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 one that got banned in People Canada after I took you? it. Oh yeah, last week before I took it, they were like, "No, of course, as them go get the Astra." None of them have got the AstraZeneca. They not. all went and got the Pfizer, right? <laughs> oh, only me. Man. They tricked you. Uh, only me, you know. And now there's there's no. We don't know if I'm, how I'm supposed to get the. Those of us, you know, who have the AstraZeneca, how we get the second dose right. because I was ask you. because you know there's a global ban on it or something. <laughs> No, there's no ban, but I mean, or something. I, I don't know. I, I don't even know what's happening, you know? But all I know, and I didn't even tell you guys about the day that I went there. First of all, I find out all these people, like, you know, my cousin Arash was saying yesterday, Arash, the same Arash who said, oh, yeah, go get Astrid. <laughs> Two days later, he went and got Pfizer. And he went to Sunnybrook <laughs> Hospital. Like, so he's in a medical setting, you know. I went to a pharmacy. I'm not even going to say where which one it was. I went to a pharmacy, first of all, there's a bunch of there's crazy people like there's a guy I swear there was a guy with like swirly eyes you know right in, li- in line like kind of sweat like kind of looked like shaking and stuff like before me right and then the one like it's a pharmacy so everybody's busy selling things or and then there's just one person in a lab coat and she comes out at one point she's looking a little nervous she hands out these clipboards okay. to to a few of us standing in line and she's like um you guys are here for the AstraZeneca you know sorry are <laughs> No word of a lie. No word of a lie. She's like, uh, the 
the, the computer system is down. Just sign these clipboards. Oh, no. You know, don't worry. Dude. You know, don't worry. We'll 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 just. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that what we have is accurate, and we'll just. I'll, oh, I'll write Lord. it down that you've gotten. I mean, there was there was no. It was like I was in some remote <laughs> developing country. I didn't get you know? hilarious. So there's not even an official record of you getting uh, who knows that what they injected. I don't oh know. You know, God, it was yeah. uh, no, no, no. I mean, afterwards, you know. <laughs> I How got did a, you book this? I got like, an email. You, <laughs> he's got a guy in the back. Did you just alley. walk in? I like, swear I booked it through the, you know, <laughs> through the pharmacy. Oh like, there, don't you remember? There was this week where they were like, AstraZeneca's available now. And this isn't just me. It's Gen Xers. You know, people between 40 and 55. Like, all of us have been, again, Douglas Copeland wrote a great piece in the Globe and Mail last week about, once again, the Gen Xers get screwed. It's like somewhere between the boomers and the millennials. We get the shit vaccine. And now they don't even, we don't even know the second dose it's like uh you know it's a it's an open question as wow. to what how we get the second dose you know what we put it uh we don't our computer system is not working for your <laughs> yeah. vaccine listen just sign here and uh you know we'll oh, inject you with whatever i have in these bottles <laughs> oh my God. next day well, man, like you, know. you have some courage you still went through with it yeah, well, I thought at the time, I, yes, I was being counseled by those around me. Little did I know they were running to get the <laughs> Pfizer vaccine. Oh, wow. I got yeah. Pfizer. <laughs> Which one you got? Oh, no. Oh. I love how when Jian got it, he was sort of proud of himself too. He was like, but you know what? This is not like a, this is not the produced version of the vaccine. That's this right. is an actual weakened version of the disease. Right. So I think well, I've you got know, more immunity. I may and- have the last laugh. You never know. <laughs> oh, we'll see. When we'll you guys out. start growing a third ear with whatever you injected, <laughs> we'll uh, find out. But yeah, it's certainly, uh, uh, who knows? Oh, Canada. So, so, anyways, the here Captain Reza, full of full of <laughs> Pfizer, you know, full to the brim with his Pfizer, is but now like, oh, I don't know if I can make it, you know. <laughs> He's even oh, walking man. a little taller with his he Pfizer is, vaccine. Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm proud of it, man, baby. <laughs> Pfizer is the Roy's Roy's of vaccine. By the way, Captain Reza is like 20 years old, and he went. Or how old are you? 33? <laughs> 33. 33. How did you get the vaccine before my mother? I got you. Guy. Got the vaccine. He got he doesn't work for the doctor. He <laughs> no, he's not a frontline worker. He's not. He got captain. it before anyone I know. <laughs> Somehow he went and talked. He talked. Uh, he's you know he's got this go. whole this yeah. guy. We don't call him Captain for nothing. That's right. Hey, he's good at that. If you need hookups, Get, man, you need hookups. You, yeah. you didn't hook up Gian. Poor guy might die soon. <laughs> yeah, if you Aquanella. need hookups, <laughs> die soon. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm God. kidding. Yeah. Please God. Me and the entire country of Britain will be <laughs> dead. <laughs> Our prime minister. <laughs> Yeah, it continues, man. And I saw, because I Zoomed with my family last night, and I saw my cousin was kind of smirking a little bit, but he didn't want to say. And he's like, yeah, I got the vaccine. He was kind of playing it down. And I was like, you did? You got, what did you, you know, he, the same one who had told me, no, 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 go, if I were you, I'd get the AstraZeneca. If you got the appointment, go get it. <laughs> Two days later, he got the Pfizer at Sunnybrook oh, Hospital. Yeah, It's become He real. probably had, I think from what I hear, he was like on a, on a lazy boy chair, like they had like somebody doing his nails you know bringing chai you know your your Pfizer vaccine is ready sir like me I was like signing a clipboard <laughs> crazy people around you. it's like people muttering to themselves <laughs> why are you sure that was, was the, the guy with for no, the vaccine I'm not sure I'm not even sure it was the vaccine I have no idea what what it oh, was man. <laughs> Like Who knows what it was? Something else, bro. <laughs> and this is why I got banned the next day. I think oh, there was just a bunch of pharmacies giving people stuff. Oh man! You're Jean Romeshi. We're trying to help you. Yeah. We don't want no, you. No, it didn't help at all. Take some. Like, didn't help at all. Trust uh, me. It was just like uh, here. Here's your clipboard, <laughs> and uh, people. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, hey, in the coming days on on Rook, look at this, Rana Mansour yes. this Thursday. Uh, the fabulous singer songwriter. I think, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, there's some great, great artists, obviously, in, in the Persian music and contemporary Persian music, and, and certainly great singers. Uh, Rana not only has one of the best voices around, I think, but she's a songwriter. You know, when she was, I love this story as I was researching, I had no idea when she was 21 years old. Rana Mansour was signed to a publishing deal with Warner Chapel Music, uh, meaning she started writing songs for others. She grew up in the States. She's she's a legit 
singer songwriter she's you know she's not just a persian cover artist or whatever and and uh of course she's um become a, a star in her own right as well in in the persian community but she performs in english as well uh, yes actually i love her voice and yeah. the first time i i heard her voice i i was like wow it's it was really fresh for my ears the Persian female singer that has this type yeah. of voice. You know? oh, she's amazing. Yeah. She's amazing. So Random Answer will join us for the entire episode on Thursday. Uh, next week on the show, and I think next week, Antonella Sacchetti, the mm. uh, the Italian journalist and blogger who loves all things Persian. Rojan Houchiar coming up in the coming days on Rook, uh, who is uh, La Femme Roge is her line. She's a fashion designer, young fashion designer uh, out of Vancouver now. She's an Iranian Canadian who kind of is fusing Middle Eastern traditional clothes um, it, with progressive modern designs. She's doing great work. She's getting an international reputation. Rojan Hushiar. And then Rastok will be yes. joining us, as we've been saying, the, the great Iranian band. Uh, and then next week, next Thursday, I guess, May 27th, we're going to run a three-part series based on interviews we did last year assessing the Pahlavi dynasty. This is uh, 40 years after the death of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, which would have been uh, last uh, summer, we made it 40 years. Uh, we've got this three-part series. Next Thursday, May 27th, we'll drop all three parts featuring Abbas Milani, Mohammad Amini, and Andrew Scott Cooper. You don't want to miss that. Next Thursday, make sure you're subscribed to Rook, and we'll get you that. Uh, we got some letters that we're going to get to after yeah. Dr. Angie. Yeah, for sure. Some really enjoyable letters to read for myself, at least, and okay. I'm sure for everybody else. All right. A good letter of the week? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this week's good. All right. We'll get to that. The fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. Let's get to our feature guest. My feature guest today says she wanted to be a doctor from the time she was nine years old as a kid in Iran. And since moving to California as a teen in the 1980s, has gone on to accomplish her mission as a full-time practicing medical doctor. But she is also a popular and passionate vegan advocate and avid fitness enthusiast. Dr. Angie Sadeghi is a specialist in gastroenterology and weight loss and an expert in all areas of the digestive system. She is a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Board of Gastroenterology. She's also a member of the American Society of Bariatric Physicians and a fitness competitor. So the story is that struggling with various health problems, including high cholesterol, fatigue, and severe eczema, Dr. Angie turned her life around with switching to a vegetarian diet in 2005, later eliminating dairy as well, becoming a vegan in 2014, and doing exercise on a regular basis. These changes transformed her body, her mind, her health into what she says is the best shape of her life. Now Dr. Angie uses her expert knowledge of the digestive system and her passion for fitness and nutrition to improve people's overall health and quality of life. She has developed a comprehensive plan to help her patients with chronic illnesses and lead healthier lives. And in the course of that, she's also become a very popular presence on her Instagram and YouTube channels. Dr. Angie has appeared in several documentaries on plant-based fitness for health and weight loss. She has been published in Vegan Health and Fitness magazine, and her latest book is called Trifecta of Health, which was published in 2019 and right now. Dr. Angie Sadeghi joins me from Newport Beach, California. Hello. Hi, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for having me. It is a thrill to have you on the program. Thank you so much for doing this. I know how busy you are. You literally are a practicing doctor and you're seeing us in between patients and I very much appreciate that. It's my pleasure. You know, I, I will say I've been so looking forward to having you on the program to hear your perspective, to get into the story of how you have become uh, so impressive and a great source of pride for the Iranian community and the diaspora. But I have to start with something that is alarming about you coming on this show. Uh, are you going to make me give up cheese? Because I'm hoping. <laughs> because I know you I know you hate dairy. You hate dairy and I have to say I'm good. I'm so good. I'm so good with the almond milk and not using butter. But to get panita name I can't give up the cheese. You're going to make me give up the cheese, aren't you? No, the paneer, you know, I mean seriously nowadays the grocery stores have so much so many options. Have you heard of the the, the Miyoko's cheese and the the um 
Violife, they're so good. Like, you know, the Violife feta cheese is exactly... It's like- not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> Don't try and convince an Iranian that the Pani Natab <laughs> that is made of soy or something is the same. Come on. The feta cheese is the hardest ones for us to give up. But, you know, it's. I always say it's not about giving anything up. It's about finding choices to insert in your diet so you never have to give anything up, you know? So let's do this. Let's do this. Let's start off with this before we even get into your story. What, because this is something that you really passionately trumpet. What, in a nutshell, do we gain if we give up dairy? Okay, well, you know, 65% of the population um, is lactose intolerant. So lactose is a sugar in dairy that is maldigested by human beings. We just don't have the digestive machinery to digest dairy very well. Um, There's a mutation in the Northern European population where they have a lot of lactase enzyme left over well into adulthood to break down dairy. But for Iranians, over 90% of Asians, African Americans, um, any actually all Middle Easterns, uh, South Europeans and Americans, it's just very difficult to break down dairy. So 65% of the population is lactose intolerant. So it's no wonder that I have a clinic full of people who come in with gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal discomfort, GERD, or gastroesophageal reflux. And once I ask them to stop consuming dairy, they get so much better. It, I see a tremendous improvement in their symptoms. Um, unfortunately, the awareness among doctors is extremely low. And so most most people go on for years and years and years, well into their adulthood, before they find out that dairy was the problem. And in the messaging too, I mean, the messaging in popular culture, I know this is somewhat shifting with the rise in, uh, of, of vegan uh, health experts, et cetera, but the messaging is still milk is good for you, especially when you're a kid, and, or that eggs, I mean, it's not just that there's egg ads, it's that the ads are, this is the source of health, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it gets confusing. Yeah, and actually it's illegal now to say that uh, it's good for you. They're not supposed to use that type of propaganda to sell their products anymore because um, the, the egg industry was doing so much. They, they had some advertisements that basically hinted at how healthy eggs are to sell their products, but now they're actually unable to do that because um, there's been crackdowns on that. But the dairy industry is extremely intelligent in being able to promote their products because they they put a mustache on an athlete, right? You look at the athlete and it says milk does a body good. I mean, no, it doesn't. Um, (laughs) um, It's all just advertisement. um, And it's not true that milk does a body good. Milk has calcium. Yes, it's true that milk has calcium and calcium is essential. But um, there are so many other things that have calcium and milk should not be, in my humble opinion, cow's milk that comes from another species. I mean, we're not cows. Like, I'm not a baby cow. Why should I eat? <laughs> Why should I drink um, cow from a, a, a cow's milk? Uh, when I was in Dubai recently, they would drink camel milk. And it's like, gross, right? But over here, we were like, oh, camel milk is gross, but cow's milk is okay. Or sheep milk is, uh, right, is right. gross. Or horse milk or dog's milk or giraffe's milk or any other mammal's milk. If You wouldn't even dr- dare drink your mother's milk. So why would you drink a cow's milk? It's disgusting. But it's just incorporated in the culture for so long and it's indoctrinated. And um, we have relied upon um, this other mammal's milk for calcium, where a lot of green leafy vegetables are full of calcium. Edamame is full of calcium. There's so many different ways. And now my, I give my son soy milk for calcium. So right. we don't really need dairy for calcium. But does first of all, the soy milk thing, I was doing soy milk for a long time, but uh, I heard that that's not great for men, that we should, and that's why I switched to almond milk. Isn't there something wrong with soy for, for guys? Good question. No, I prefer soy milk over almond milk still. And I'll tell you what, there was a rumor in the, um, like 20, 30 years ago, some rumor came out. Uh, the dairy industry, the dairy or the meat industry, they formed this um, nonprofit organization to demonize um, soy because soy was gaining popularity and people were ditching dairy and ditching meat and uh, eating more soy. So what what happened is they figured they tried to figure out a way to demonize soy and it worked. So what they did is they came and they made rumors that and these are purely rumors. These, this is not scientific fact. 
that soy has estrogen. Yes, now, yes, it's not true. That. So soy has some, first of all, in order to have estrogen, you have to be a, a, a mammal. And you, you know, it comes from the ovaries mostly. Most women have a lot of estrogen. The ovaries make a lot of estrogen. Men have estrogen too, a little bit that the bodies um, make. But if, uh, soy is not uh, a mammal. Soy doesn't have ovaries, and soy does not produce estrogen. There's a chemical called phytoestrogen, which is actually plays a role of an antioxidant. And phytoestrogen is not the same as estrogen, and it's actually protective against breast cancer, which was uh, previously demonized as something, a chemical that could cause breast cancer. We know, now we know that based on some studies they did on, on uh, patients with history of breast cancer, that it actually competes with the estrogen receptor and uh, protects women with cancer or history of cancer or who don't have cancer against uh, breast cancer. So, so is actually healthy for you. Is it bad for men? No, it's not. Men actually have, like, I do hormone therapy all the time on men, um, testosterone replacement therapy. I check their estrogen levels. And um, most men uh, have a little bit of estrogen in their bodies. When they shoot up testosterone, their estrogen levels go up a little bit because testosterone converts to estrogen. So we have to use medicines to block the estrogen. But I can tell you that soy milk <laughs> does not increase your- so, uh, so to be specific about it, if I have some soy milk with my smoothie or with cereal, uh, I will not unnaturally grow my breasts. <laughs> No, because I, I'd, I'd actually heard this. I mean, this is a this is the thing that uh, I, that actually dissuaded me. The estrogen thing was something I had heard, and people said, "No, no, almond milk is better for men." And uh, I, I mean, what do I know? You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, almond milk is not, in my opinion, is uh, not as superior as soy milk because soy milk has a higher level of protein. And a lot of times nowadays, the soy milk is fortified with vitamin D, so is regular milk, so cow's milk. So I think soy milk is, to, in my opinion, a better choice, and that's what I give my son, and that's what I drink myself. So does does yogurt get an asterisk? Yeah, because I've heard yogurt is like they, you know, they sort of say well, milk is bad, but yogurt to get, you know, or <laughs> is okay. Oh my gosh, you know what? That's a good question. You know, uh, there I I choose uh, coconut um, yogurt and soy yogurt over um, cow's yogurt just because I think it's gross to drink cow's milk honestly, and I I think it's really gross. There's pus in there, like when they milk the breast of the cow, it's disgusting. It's dirty. There's bacteria. There's these factories. There's all kinds of poop around. When they milk the cow, there's like pus that comes out of the cow's breast because it's like infected because they're connected to machines constantly milking them i you couldn't get me to drink cow's milk or the products that are made out of cow's milk i, I i'd rather die it's disgusting it's the most disgusting thing on earth wow. um so that's one factor the the other factor is that it's um it's extreme the dairy industry is one of the cruelest industries out there and and, you know, I mean, I think that if you're in the middle of Africa and all you can get is cow's milk, go for it. You know, I mean, if you need to feed your kid who is, who's malnutritioned and all you have is a pet cow that you can milk, do it. Okay, but in a, in a country like the United States where there's no famine, where there's no, like, it's not like soy milk and soy yogurt and coconut like there's this brand called so called so delicious and their yes. yogurt is to die for like why would i give that up to go drink cow's milk i'm not you know and, and thank god i can afford a yogurt that's a little bit more expensive i have a whole foods and a mother's market next to me so i mean don't get me wrong i'm not saying like nobody should eat yogurt from a cow i just think that if you can afford it if you're sophisticated enough to know the health benefits of it and if you have access to a whole foods and a mother's market by all means i think it's a better choice okay. Okay. does that make sense well yeah like, that, that makes sense that makes sense and yeah. and, and i mean people uh, listening in iran right now and they're barely getting I, I don't know how it is right now, but back when I was in Iran, we had to get coupon to get like milk or whatever. And that's all we could get. That, that That's that's fine. I mean, they don't have tofu over there. They don't have soy milk, yogurt or whatever. If that's all you can give your kids to feed them to not be calcium deficient, 
by all means, go for it. Don't feel bad. But I'm just saying, if you're living in North America, I got it. Yeah, uh, you yeah. have the luxury of all these health food uh, restaurants and places. It's just, why would you want to drink milk from a breast of a cow? <laughs> There's something in researching um, you and and reading your works, etc., that I was reminded of as well, which you just touched on, which is that we often. At this point, uh, we know, or at least those in you know urban areas of uh, developed countries, etc. I mean, I, I think most people understand that that um, there is an ethical argument to be made about eating animals. Pe- you know, you can still choose to eat them or not eat them, but but there is an argument that a, a legitimate argument to say, look at this is this is ethically wrong. Uh, what you've reminded me of in in researching you, Doctor Angie, is that is that. Uh, dairy, it comes from, it, you could make the same ethical arguments or even more so make the arguments around cruelty to animals, etc., uh, by just eating dairy. Uh, but that, 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 that dairy has the same connotations. If that's the hang up, if the issue is, is ethical, that th- those same arguments can be made, yes? Absolutely. Actually, John, I, I don't know if you know this, but um, the dairy, I didn't know for a while. Um, but I, I'm an ethical vegan, which means I do it. Um, I went vegan 100% for the animals, and then I realized the health benefits later um, in my life. But um, the dairy industry is far more cruel than the, the meat industry, and most people don't know that. And it happens so that it's worse for your GI tract um, than most of the other foods. And so that's why I got so involved in speaking up about it. Like I said, 65% of the population is lactose intolerant. And I have I have so many people that get much better when they right. ditch dairy. Um, the, you, you, it's like unbelievable. Like I get fired as a doctor all the time because not fired. I'm kidding, but it's in a good way that they come see me and first meeting them like, ditch dairy, come back and tell me how you're doing. And they come back and they're like, I don't need your help anymore because I'm feeling great. <laughs> right, right, I'm like, well, right. wonderful. I love that. I love hearing that. You're bad for your own business. Is, is that what I'm bad for my own business. Right. But, you know, as you know, I'm a passionate doctor and I didn't go into it for business reasons. I went, to it to help, I went into it to help people and I'm loving the results I get when people ditch dairy. Now, let me, uh, before I leave the, the, the food, uh, uh, the questions around food, because it's fascinating to me and I hope it's as interesting for people who are listening um, I'm not even going to ask you whether I can still keep eating kebab because I know the answer <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I do want to say this to you and you know because I was vegetarian for years um, I think it was about 20 years that I was from basically after I left high school until just a few years ago I was vegetarian and then about five or six years ago when I started eating meat again uh, I don't like the ethics of it, but I feel good sometimes when I eat meat. I mean, is it is it possible that my body does well when I eat a lean piece of chicken or, or steak, that it just it suits me somehow? Well, let me ask you this. Why did you initially go vegetarian? Uh, ethical reasons and, um, uh, well... <laughs> Actually, the truth is my family went, uh, my dad loved buffets. My dad was, you know, uh, uh, he had this old, I I blame it as, I call it an old Iranian conception, but, you know, that somehow a buffet uh, meant opulence. So my dad would be like, we'd be like, dad, let's go for brunch. And he'd say, is it buffet? It is buffet? And we'd be like, well, no, but no, we must go buffet. So we went to this buffet place that was this, I think this Asian place that, or quasi Asian place that's, that still exists uh, in, in called Mandarin in the Toronto area. And I remember, and I just ate so much and I felt so sick. And it was one of those places where you get like the the orange fried balls, like the sorry, the fried balls with the orange sauce on it, that so the so called Chinese food it has probably has nothing to do with actual Chinese food. But anyway, after that, and the person, uh, my girlfriend at the time was uh, was a vegetarian. I just I, I said that's it. I said no more. I'm not eating any, you know. And I stuck with it for a while, um, mm. but for from for years, in fact. But you know, I had always wondered. I thought all those years, I thought, what would happen if I ate a burger? What would happen if I ate a steak? Am I going to get sick? Am I going to freak out? Is my body going to repel it somehow? And honestly, it felt good. It doesn't feel so that. So, how do you respond to somebody who says that to you? 
Well, you know, um, anecdotal evidence doesn't really dictate any in any way, shape or form how we should eat or practice medicine. It's all about epidemiological studies, and that's all we can rely, rely on. And if you look at the, for example, there's a, there's a study called the EPIC study. There's a, another study called the PLCO study. In combination, um, they had, I believe, I think overall there were 300,000 individuals that participated in this study, which weighs heavier than um, like me as a person, I felt better eating this. So if you, if you look at this study, the, the evidence is very clear that um, red meat, a high consumption of red meat is associated with cancer and consumption of processed meat is without a doubt um, associated with cancer where the World Health Organization has deemed it as cancer causing. So, so, and then red meat has also been associated. So we have a processed meat that is definitely associated and red meat, which is um, associated, but we need further studies. So that's how, it, it, you know, to be honest with you, nutrition research uh, right. is very limited now. We still need to do a, lot, a ton of research to definitively say, don't eat meat at all. But the studies are pointing to um, perhaps that heme iron in meat can be cancer causing. Right. Anecdotally, you, you're saying you felt better, but I don't know. Most um, people, when they go on a healthy plant-based diet, a lot of athletes, for example, they feel faster, they feel stronger, they feel um, they feel better. Um, usually, people's uh, cholesterol goes down. Um, people um, who have skin problems, sometimes the skin problem goes goes away. Um, anecdotally, a lot of clinics are now pe putting people on a plant-based diet to fix a lot of diseases mm -hmm. like obesity, hypertension, mm -hmm. diabetes. Now, you know, then the question is, well, how plant-based do I have to be? Do I have to be vegan to feel good? No, no. Veganism is a way of living. Like I, I can show you my shoes right now are not leather. Mm -hmm. I don't wear fur. I don't buy products that are non-vegan. Veganism mm -hmm. is a way of life. It's mm -hmm. just basically respect for animals where you feel like as you're not at top of the food chain where you can torture and hurt animals below mm -hmm. you. You don't see yourself as a self-centered person higher than everything else right. around you. You see yourself as part of the ecosystem and you try to take care of the voiceless, take care of the animals who are being tortured right. constantly. And it's it's a, in my in my humble opinion as as I become the more vegan I I've become and it's by the way it's it's like a journey. It's not an overnight thing. Mm. The more humble I feel, the more I feel like I'm part of the ecosystem. Um, but, but really, uh, uh, I mean, who will who will speak for the coconuts? All the coconuts you're running around killing, and there uh, you go. Yeah, exactly. That's my favorite fruit, so I'll speak for them. <laughs> <laughs> They're voiceless as you destroy them for your own sake. You see, you know, I, I, I actually when I mentioned kebabs and and most and dul, you know, for example, I I was kind of leading somewhere, and I don't know if this is a an absurd question to to, to even ask, but. Do you think, uh, given your own uh, heritage, uh, which forms part of the basis why we're, you're on our program, do you, do you think it's particularly hard for Iranians to embrace vegetarianism, veganism, uh, given the staples of our cuisine? I mean, I mean, I don't. I'm not the type of person who lives by tradition. I was born and raised in Iran until I was 13. And I came here at in at, when I was thirteen. It's not like I was born here. It's not like I was, you know, I was um, raised here since I was two. I'm as Iranian as it can get, but I have chosen to give up some of the traditions. And I, to to me, it just depends. Like I am not one who holds on to bad traditions or things that my grandmother mother did that I think are wrong. You right. know, I, for example, I'm not a very religious person. I was born Muslim and I was raised Muslim, but I'm not very Muslim. But you know, I mean, I don't practice a certain way just like my grandmother did because my grandmother did it. I have to do it. I don't do that. I choose my choices. Like my path is my path. It doesn't matter if 10,000 years of tradition told me to do something. If I think it's wrong, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we're evolving. We're constantly evolving. If we just make the same bad mistakes, we're not going to evolve in a positive way. And I think that 
you know, if you look at the meat and dairy industry, you know, it's not sustainable to farm animals. And um, it's better for the environment, it's better for the animals, and it's better for our health to, to, health to eat a mostly plant-based diet. So just because tradition asked me to, I'm not going to do it. But it's not I, necessarily, it's not necessarily, tradi- I mean, it is, but but how aggressive are you about that? I mean, if you go to a Mahmouni and there's, you know, the typical big t- table of, of uh, you know, kebabs and korma sabzi and fesenjun and all the things that are meat-based stews etc uh, uh, do you do you speak up do you say excuse me no uh, i'm not i don't inconvenience other people because of my choices to be honest i'm pretty chill i'm a very chill person i usually if i know where i'm going like honestly like i have uh thousands of friends who are also plant-based now so it's very easy for me and when i go places people are always so kind to have something to eat for me but i don't make a fuss i usually just go and eat something there's always something there's a salad or i honestly i'm not one who would make a fuss about it and and nowadays um in in california no matter what iranian restaurant i go to there's always right. a vegan version right. of the same khoresh qayme khoresh gorme sabzi um fes and june all of it is prepared without meat because of the high demand honestly like there are, there are a ton of people nowadays who don't uh, consume um animals and so you know the j- restaurants have to pivot right, right. like do you remember how like I learned a little, I've learned a little bit about business, being a business owner myself. And, you know, when Netflix came, Blockbuster was like, oh, no, we're going to stick to the tradition. People <laughs> right. want to come in and buy our tapes and or rent our tapes. They didn't pivot fast enough. They didn't evolve fast enough. And they went out of business. Netflix took over. You know, when the, the, this new um, dietary trend that has come out, the, the majority plant-based eating, um, if the restaurants, there's such a huge demand in California, if restaurants don't uh, pivot and uh, and plan ahead, and if they don't evolve, they're not going to make it because the dairy consumption has gone down, the meat consumption is going to continue to go down. And if so, I, I feel like at least where I live, honestly, there are so many yes. choices. Yes. I live in like a heavenly place. You do. You, I mean, you I are in the Mecca. You are in the Mecca of this stuff. But but most of the people listening to this program are in urban areas, whether it's Sydney, Australia, or Berlin, Germany, or London, England, or, or Toronto. So none of what you're saying is inaccessible, I think, to much of our audience. You know, one of the things I really appreciate about you, and I think one of the reasons why what you do um, so resonates with people that you've got this now massive following online is that you do walk the walk. Uh, and this comes from personal experience with you. And it seems um, from what I can garner, there was a change, uh, Angie John, in, in in two ways in your life. One, in deciding what kind of a doctor you wanted to be in terms of what you were preaching to your patients. And uh, two, your own habits in terms of what you eat and how you live your life. And I want to take those one at a time. Because for number one, you had a turning point as a doctor where you realized you wanted to stop using pharmaceuticals and you wanted to begin practicing what you call integrative medicine. How, how did that turning point happen? So um, actually, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to kind of, um, just, just this last statement, I, 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 I do use pharmaceutical. I'm still an oh. evidence-based uh, practitioner, I'm a medical doctor, and that means that I do use pharmaceuticals, and but but integrative is correct in that I integrate nutrition into my practice. Uh, sorry, I'll give you an example. Like let's just say somebody comes in with gas, bloating, and heartburn. Um, I try to uh, test them for celiac disease and see if gluten is a problem. I try to test them for uh, H. pylori infection, and I try to make sure that they avoid dairy. I make sure that they eat a low-fat diet. If that doesn't work, then I put them on medicines. And so dietary changes are extremely important. And in all of the medical guidelines that you look at, uh, lifestyle modifications are key in preventing disease, reversing disease, and um, and improving disease processes. Unfortunately, in our traditionally, doctors haven't emphasized enough on d- lifestyle medi- uh, modifications in order to ju- accomplish those goals. And in my practice, I just tend to rely heavily on lifestyle modifications to improve disease process so I don't have to use as much pharmaceuticals. But 
you know, m most uh, most of the time, um, if it's needed, if it's much needed, I I'm not going to leave my patients hanging and say, oh well, I'm not going to use pharmaceuticals. I it's got just you. I got you. That was my my. I got the term, and I I I overemphasized. But I think what I what I understand is that you you came to the realization that in some forms of what for some do for doctors out there, and you and you worried if I have this correctly that you were becoming one that the answer has reflexively become to just prescribe drugs. Uh, yes, to, yeah. And, and that that doesn't always have to be what you guys do, right? Right, absolutely. I think prevention is key. Prevention, prevention, prevention. Like, for example, I teach my patients, like, once a week I'll, um, or once a month, I'll see someone with colon cancer. Now, um, they would tell me, you know that if they were to go back they would eat a healthier diet so um, it's really hard to teach patients to eat healthy to prevent disease because especially in our 20s and 30s we feel so invincible it's not until our 40s where we're like oh wait a minute i have friends who are getting sick and i have parents who are getting sick and then in your 50s disease does sit in usually and then you get your heart problems, cholesterol problems. And so it's like, you know, if, if we could go back, like we all would right. say, oh, shoot, I should have done this better. And I, so my focus is to teach my patients to prevent disease and live a healthy lifestyle where they are a healthier lifestyle, a more ethical lifestyle and more environmentally sound lifestyle. And I think that, you know, I guess you get to a point where you can't ignore where's my food coming from? I mean, where did that come from? I mean, am I just going to eat anything that's on my plane or plate? Or am I going to think, where did that? It's kind of like when you use the analogy of money, right? People know dirty money. They would never accept dirty money or a stolen Rolex, but they would never buy a stolen Rolex, but they will eat the food in front of them and never ask, where did that food come from? You know what I mean? So I feel like just like you wouldn't accept dirty money, um, why would you just eat the thing that's on your plate without asking where did my food come from and how did it get here? Right. And right. how what kind of implications does it have on my body? Is it like wearing me down or is it health right. health promoting? Right. You know, and I, if it's not health promoting, I, I, I teach my patients keep a balance, but live a healthier lifestyle where you don't look back and say, I regret eating all that processed meat and dairy. That's now causing me. But we do. But we sometimes do things that aren't good for us. I mean, I, I, I always, I always feel sick after I eat an inevitable entire bucket of popcorn when I go to the movies. <laughs> when too. I go to the movies, I. But yeah. but I can't stop my. You know, for me, that's yeah. part of the experience. It's I'll I'll trade off the sickness that I feel afterwards yeah. for what for eating the popcorn while I'm watching the yeah, movie. Yeah, no, I get it. You know, Anthony Robbins always talks about that pain pleasure type of thing. You have to keep a balance. It's not about being a hundred percent. It's about doing more, like daily good habits. You know, maybe you'll have a bucket of popcorn, but you'll also work out every day and eat a lot of vegetables on the same day. So it's not about being perfect. Um, even I'm an imperfect vegan. Um, nobody's perfect. I feel like it's just about instead of being 100 percent, I think you should just think about what can I do today to nourish my body? You know, look, I'm an athlete. So for me, if I eat a bucket of popcorn the next day i'm gonna have pain try to like lift weights and i'm not, i'm gonna be like screw I f i'm gonna feel sick and i'm gonna like not be able to do my handstands the way i do i'm not gonna lift weights the way i do but if i eat clean i'm gonna feel like an energizer bunny at the right. uh, at the gym so i always think about is this worth it and sometimes i go go for the popcorn and i go for the vegan chocolate vegan popcorn by the way but the, but the the point is that of course like no one is perfect right even even if you're an athlete you're not perfect but you know it's just keeping a balance well now let me ask you how you changed your eating habits and uh i you tell me if the story is correct or if it's too personal i i don't want to as but when you were in medical school as i understand it you were still eating dairy and there was a moment when you were on a plane and uh, even though your life was going well, even though you were accomplishing your dream of becoming a doctor, which is what you wanted to do, and you had a good family, and you were doing well in life, you were depressed. You were a depressed person, so much so that you had a moment on that plane where you wanted the plane to crash mm -hmm. and to die. 
Uh, and you believe that was about your diet, at least partly. Uh, tell me how much you think diet can affect our mood. Uh, in my case, it could affect it a lot. Very, very. I do, I do remember, and it's so true. That is a true story. I was I I wanted that plane to crash because I li literally didn't want to live. I lived with a debilitating postular eczema. This is like. It looks literally like you have the herpes infection all over your skin, mm. all over my body. And it was very, very itchy. Um, the eczema was so bad that I had to, to um, take Benadryl um, to be able to sleep at night. I would have to put tubes and tubes of corticosteroids on my skin to stop itching. I was tired. I literally could not stay awake past two o'clock. I was exhausted. I would fall asleep during lecture. It was really affecting my quality of life i had to drag myself everywhere and it's like it's no way to live i was i was a disaster my health was a disaster i was overweight didn't feel confident when i started my health journey and i started incorporating a plant-based diet into my life avoided the dairy which but i was highly highly allergic to dairy i mean it gave me the pustular eczema that i was telling you about and I started working out, my life changed because suddenly I was excited about life. My mood changed to a point where I was like happy. I started taking pictures of myself, put myself on Instagram, started teaching other people, educating other people. Before that, I was not excited about life. You know, mm. I, I just basically was merely surviving. Mm. Um, and then when I started taking care of my body, my body is, you know, is is should be number one if i can't take care of my body how could i take care of other people and give back to other people or right. give back to society right. so when i went on taking care of my body i went into thrive mode not so much so that i was able to start taking care of other people and helping other people and that was great it just gave me so much hope and happiness it's very, I mean, it's inspirational talking to you. The, the, uh, it's becoming a lot harder for me to eat that cheese now that I, <laughs> it's, it's waiting for me after this interview, but I, I, I'm, I, I may hold out. There's <laughs> in your latest book, uh, try it's, it's the book is called trifecta of health that you co-authored. And there's, if the trifecta, the three things, as I understand it, are nutrition, exercise, and hormones. I, I think most people, um, and if they don't, they should follow you and they can, they can learn more. But I think most people would understand the nutrition part and the exercise part. Uh, obviously, we need to learn the details of how we can um, do those things better. Um, the hormones part, what, what can I do about my hormones? Nothing. You're too young. But <laughs> there's an age-related age decline in the elderly. So um, I shouldn't say elderly, I, you know, actually after age 50, uh, many, many people have a decline in hormones. You know, women have estrogen and progesterone and testosterone deficiency, and men usually develop uh, low testosterone levels. All of this can cause osteoporosis, it could cause um, muscle um, loss called sarcopenia, it can affect the mucous membranes of the vaginal tract and people can um, have dryness. It can cause a lot of urinary tract infections. Men's libido go down and they can have sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction. All of these hormonal declines can affect people. And when it does, I really highly recommend that people do optimize their hormones um, uh, to a point where they prevent this age-related decline. You know, if you think about it, 200 years ago, we lived to be 40 years old. Most women would die in childbirth or of an infection. Most men would die, um, you know, of, in, in the war or, you know, in, um, as, of, as a result of an infection. So the life expectancy was around 40 years old. So I wouldn't even have this discussion with you. I'd be dead. Although I don't want to admit that I'm 48. I am. <laughs> So I would be dead by now. So, but but as we are and now, I'm like literally in the midst of my practice. I'm 48 years old, and I'm like at the at the uh, top of my the world. Like I have everything that I've ever ever wanted, career wise, family wise. So it's just a really awesome place to be. And I don't want to die. I don't want to feel uh, tired and sad mm -hmm. and you know sarcopenic. I want to be. I want to thrive. And I know that I'm going to practice as a practicing physician for another 20 years and 
I want to live to be 100 years old, right? So when you start living longer in life, you have to think about, well, how could I um, sustain that kind of longevity? I have to make sure my bones work, my brain works, my heart works, my kidneys and liver work. So that's where you have to think about, okay, if my compelling vision is that I'm going to be alive in another 50, 60 years, what do I do now? And I think, I, my humble opinion is that we should um, not only eat healthy and exercise, but think about bioidentical hormone replacement therapy to help us feel young as we age. So that's what I was going to ask. How do I optimize my hormones? What, do, what does that mean? I, I really don't know. I, I buy hormones? No, it's it's basically these are prescription. Okay, the, this is all you, you have. And <laughs> who do I buy? Who, who do I buy hormones from? Where do I get these hormones? <laughs> <laughs> the pharmacy. Um, so you would have to see a doctor expert in. Uh, it, there are experts in anti aging. It's called anti aging. I don't like to call it anti aging because nothing really reverses your age. Right, right, right. It's really age management. Like you don't want to feel your age. You don't want to feel ninety. You want to feel fifty. You don't want to feel fifty. You want to feel twenty. You know, it's just age management. That's all it is. It doesn't reverse aging. So basically, you just go to an anti-aging or age management doctor who is an expert in in giving you the hormones that you need to feel better. <laughs> but you're too young for this. I'm now. not that. Yeah, stop saying that. I, I I'm freaked out now. I got to buy hormones. I got to stop eating <laughs> kebab. I mean, there's a list I'm developing. Um, I, I want to. Um, <laughs> I want you to take us back uh, and, and we'll come back to this moment for you. And it's so beautiful to hear you talk about how, how good you feel about where you've gotten to in life. Uh, you, you say you wanted to be a doctor from the time you were nine years old. So you were in Iran at, at that time. And if I, if I do the math right, I think that's about three years after the revolution in Iran and a very turbulent time for a kid to be living through in Iran. How do you, Angie, how do you remember those years and, and where did the doctor idea first get implanted in you? Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I, I remember so much chaos during the revolution, people hiding, people dying. It was just an unbelievably stressful time. And I actually lived there. Um, I, we lived in the midst of the war. So I remember the war. I remember bombs dropping next to our house and, um, I, you know, thinking, man, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to see my family tomorrow. I might just die in my sleep if a bomb drops on our house. It was a very traumatic experience. You know, it's it was a very difficult time for the Iranians over there. And when I was nine years old, my aunt and my dad were, you know, they, they my dad is a feminist. It's really interesting. <laughs> Female empowerment is, is a thing for him. And my my um, aunt was always all about education. She's a teacher. She was a teacher in Iran. She's all about education and female empowerment. Ironically, my mom, not, not, not much at all. Like she mm. wasn't into it, but, um, my father, uh, my aunt and my father, I don't know if it was purposeful or just randomly, they showed me a documentary on Madame Curie. And I basically watched this documentary and I was so impressed by her and how amazing she was. And, um, and I saw, and it's really important to show your kids female role models if you have daughters, you know, because we live in a man's world and we still do. There's, there's less disparity, but we're still um, living in a man's world. And, and uh, so it's important if you have daughters to basically help them um, in, in that sense. And my father showed me that documentary and and I started she became my role model you know she was a physician scientist and I was like wow how admirable is that and when I brought up to my um oh a few days later I went to see a doctor and this doctor just walked in with that white coat and confident and knowledgeable and it was so impressive I was like how cool would it be if I could be a doctor and on my way back from the visit I turned around and I told my father and my mother who were in the front seat of our green pecan, <laughs> pecan car. We were going back home uh, on the drive back. I was like, I would love to become a doctor. And my father said, that's amazing. That's fantastic. Good job. And my mom is like, ah, whatever. You know, it's like a tough life for a woman. You know, if you want to have kids, you may want to consider not doing that. You know, <laughs> and my dad kind of elbowed her like, shh, shh. 
anyway, but it was too late. I had already made up my mind. I was going to do it no matter what. It was just just so strong, such a strong, compelling vision. I started visualizing myself in that role, and it never stopped. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's not entirely a stretch for an Iranian for Iranian parents to be into their uh, kid becoming a doctor. <laughs> it's it's uh, the fact. I mean, you're 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 making a lot of people proud and uh, a lot of us uncomfortable that we're not you now because we know our oh, parents please. might be <laughs> might be listening to this. But um, you, you, I mean, you're such an American superstar at this point. But you were in Iran until your your teens, and and I have to think that the transition was not easy coming west it's a question we ask a lot on this show but what was your first generation immigrant story like when you first arrived in america did you fit in did you feel comfortable did did it feel like i'm now i'm home this is the place i'm gonna i'm gonna advance and become this uh, great doctor oh my god it was the hardest thing i've ever done in my life it was it was very very it was a very difficult slow transition um, you know, especially because my father was very much into hanging on to all of our traditions, you know, and customs. And he wanted us to be super Persian and Iranian, like growing up. But um, so I was caught between two worlds, my dad hanging on to culture and 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 me trying to fit in in school and uh, learn the language. I was like, you know, again, I want to be a doctor. Like, I, I need to compete with Americans in English, in literature, in writing, and science. I've got to, like, perform better than them to achieve the same level or higher level than them. So I was caught between these two worlds, strong culture in my family, uh, preventing us from advancing in, in the language, speaking English. They they didn't want to even speak to us in English at home. Oh, wow. Then I had to go to school and not speak Farsi at all. And I made a point not to hang out with any of my Iranian friends because I was like, I need to learn this language ASAP. Like, I can't afford not to know it. And I didn't even know anything but the alphabet. So so it's very difficult. Um, culturally, you know, it was such a culture shock. The way you dress is different. The way you speak is different. You know the way your tone is is different um we come across as more abrasive like when we're talking with our hands and we talk loudly and we're very opinionated where the american culture is kind of kind of like chill and you know especially in orange county california you know they don't really talk with their hands and they don't speak loudly and they're kind of chill easy going and here i am a very hot-tempered iranian girl <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jian, I had the hardest time fitting in. I Nobody liked me at school. I was like, you know, I just stood out like a sore thumb. I didn't dress the way everyone else dressed. I didn't act the way everyone else acted. I didn't speak a word of English. It was so hard. I, it was devastatingly hard. And then, you know, you would go home and your parents are having the same struggles because they don't speak English and they're trying to fit in in this I mean, imagine moving to a whole different country in a totally different culture, like, and like they're a hundred years ahead of us. You know, you know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about, yeah. um, I mean, you are so confident and outgoing and clearly comfortable in your own skin as a presenter now, as an educator, beyond being a doctor. Um, if, if you Google your name, all these photos come up of this empowered doctor. There's pictures of you in a bikini, rocking your fitness, uh, you know, uh, look, and all of that. Uh, that must be an interesting journey for you. I mean, that, that what you're describing as the teenager from Iran who didn't fit in and nobody liked. Uh, I'm sure that's an exaggeration, but could you have imagined at that time that you would become the you you are now? You know, I, I knew that I was going to, I was very motivated. I was a very motivated child and my dad always empowered me. And he always told me, you can do whatever you want in life. So, you know, and I, I knew I was going to do something uh, good. I just didn't know exactly what. I was lost like every other child in America, in, in the world, like very insecure. I was very, very insecure and um, not comfortable in my skin. Um, you know, I hated my body. I would hide. I would not put on a bathing suit. I was like, I was, I was hiding inside towels and, you know, it was just, it was just a very tough time. No, I never knew that I was going to take pictures in my bikini, uh, much less as a doctor. I didn't think that, but 
when I got to the, once I, I beat my, once I went plant-based and my body transformed and I wasn't overweight anymore. And I had this child, I had given birth to my child. I had no excuse to be overweight anymore. I lost the weight. I was proud to show my body off as a mom, as a doctor to, to show people that it's possible. Why did you go into gastroenterology? I, 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 it seems so hard. <laughs> like, I mean, couldn't you be like a a foot doctor or like a dentist or something that's a you know not, not as messy? I, I I don't know. It just seems like a very a profoundly difficult stream to go into. Why did that? that? Messy. <laughs> that's funny. I love that. Something sexier than butts and guts, <laughs> right? Well, I don't know. I mean, I find any any person working in the medical field, I am so impressed with because I couldn't do it. I don't think I could handle it. I get I get queasy, but I uh, and it's such a hard job. But why why this particular stream? Uh, good question. You know, back when I went into GI, there were very very few female GIs around because it is a procedural field, and women at that time shied away from procedural fields. Um, because of life quality of life, because of lack of role models in the field. And during the time that I was applying, I wanted to either be a cardiologist or a nephrologist. And um, one of my attendings, um, a female attending, female gastroenterologist, um, came to me and said, you should go into GI. You're very good with your hands on procedures, and you would um, make an excellent GI doctor. And I was like, wow, I've never thought about it, but uh, maybe you're right. And, and she really motivated me. And she says, you know, as a woman, you break the glass uh, um, c- ceiling and you pull other women with you. And I thought, wow, how cool would it be? Maybe I should go to GI. And I, I, I don't mean to brag, but I was, I was a very good um, resident physician and I was very good at procedures. Like when nobody else could do certain things, like with their hands, with procedural, they would call me and be like, oh, Angie will do it you know, if, if anything that had to do with procedures. So I was, I was like known in my group to be the procedure person. And so GI is a, is like half, uh, cognitive, uh, internal medicine kind of, uh, thinking and half procedural. Cause you do have to be good at procedures. You do endoscopies on colonoscopies all the time. And I thought, well, that's a perfect field for me, honestly. And I, I later on, I learned nutrition and I enjoy, I started really enjoying nutrition. So it was like the perfect marriage of being a doctor and studying nutrition and applying all of that so it was just a blessing i couldn't have i can't even think of anything better that could have suited me as much i went for my first uh, colonoscopy ever uh, last year and it was a it's a female doctor who did it and uh i i was i was kind of ashamed i don't know why like after it was over <laughs> I just felt so embarrassed that this uh, poor woman, this doctor, had to deal with it. You know, I, I mean, I know for her, I was just another patient, another person. But, but uh, it, it's a tough. I mean, it's you know, your field is a, it's an interesting one, certainly. No, it is. It's it's a wonderful field. Um, it's become like in the old days when people had GI problems, they would go into surgery. And now, like, people had a little ulcer bleed, they, their stomach would be cut out. And now we're able to non-invasively, with the use of uh, scopes, go in and figure out what's, what the problem is and fix it. It's brilliant. Um, technology, what technology has done. Um, yeah, it's a really great field. So let me ask you uh, a question that maybe strikes to the heart of what you do and who you've become. There's, there's, in researching you and in, in thinking about you and certainly in hearing you talk, even on Instagram in your little videos or when you're, you've been interviewed, the word mission comes up. You're on a mission. You're on a mission for plant-based diets. You're on a mission against dairy. You're on a, a mission for people to live he- healthier lives. You're on a mission to, to uh, extol the virtues of fitness. Um, when did you go from being a health professional, a, g- a good one, a great at procedures, to being on a mission, do you think? I think, you know, it was really cool when I went plant-based and I started feeling so amazing and I had all this all this energy I didn't know what to do with. Like, I literally did not have energy before. I slept a lot. I couldn't get enough sleep. I was tired, dragging my feet 
to becoming this energized person who is feeling amazing morning, morning till night with so much energy and so much to offer. I feel like, wow, I'm really good at teaching people how to live a healthy lifestyle. I'm a doctor, so I can help them with health. And now I have this, uh, this personal experience that has helped me and that could help other people. And I felt like I, I it, it suddenly I found purpose. And that's how I found my mission is because when I found purpose in life, mm. and then, you know, it's funny, I, this is a good question really to think about it because I have a lot of patients who come to me and they're very depressed um, and who are empty nesters. Like literally they had a few kids, three kids, and th their entire purpose in life was to raise these kids. And believe me, I'm a mom and I love my son to death. He's like the, my favorite human being in the world, my Bijan. But when you make your purpose solely about your kids or your work and you have nothing else to offer and it's all about you, you become very self-centered. What happens is when these kids live, you have, you have depression. And then, you know, a lot of my patients go through a divorce after the kids go to college because now they find no purpose in life. Like they have nothing in common, the husband and wives. So I feel like seeing this happening a lot, um, I look in my life and I'm really happy because I feel like I have purpose beyond me. I have purpose beyond my son. I have purpose beyond just being self-centered and think about me all the time. It's when you start thinking about how can I help others? How could I help the animals that you feel like you just have something bigger than you? And it's hard for me to be depressed now because there's so much to live for. Your social media presence has grown massively. I mean, you have a huge audience, say, on Instagram. Who are they? Who is your audience? It's interesting. I've actually done a quick analysis. Usually young people, 25 to 18 to 35. Um, there's always outliers, but most of them are young, uh, very healthy, fitnessy, very health conscious individuals. Um, a lot of them are plant-based. A lot of them are plant curious. Um, they want to embark on the journey, but they're afraid of protein deficiency, calcium deficiency, all the typical stuff people worry about. Um, they want to do it, but they need motivation. They want to go to the gym, but they need motivation. They want to eat healthy, but they need motivation. People who are interested in gut health, um, um, a lot of Iranians who are going vegan in Iran. God, I love them and I'm so proud of them. I hope they're listening. I love you guys so much from the bottom of my heart because knowing what they're going through in that country, um, yet they're still thinking about the animals and going vegan. There's a huge population, by the way, believe wow. me. And they always ask me, uh, please, please have an Instagram that's v a vegan Instagram. And I actually just started one. But it's just so cool. And it warms my heart because my fellow countrymen, the Iranians, are just such amazing people. They're lovely people and just love them so much. That's all I have to say. You know, I've told this story before. I think I've told this story on the show. I'm not sure. But when I was a vegetarian... <laughs> I, this is I would have started in the uh, I was in my early twenties. It was in the nineties, late nineties, and 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 my my sister had gone to Iran. Uh, this is in the late nineties, and uh, saw some of my family there, our extended family, and they had said, "How's Jian doing?" And she said, "Oh, she he's a vegetarian. You know, he doesn't he's not eating meat." And they had at the time, some of them anyways had said, uh, or somebody had said, uh, "Oh, she should they mad he's it like." <laughs> <laughs> they, they couldn't understand why somebody <laughs> wouldn't be eating meat. You know, it wasn't a, so, um, uh, you know, awesome. uh, it's a good story. We, yeah. I, not to throw my, uh, my, my family's very progressive in Iran now. They've taken, you know, but, but uh, it, it's interesting to hear how things have changed in the last couple of decades in Iran. If you're, if you know, and, and to hear of your following there and people becoming vegan, what are the most interesting reactions you've received on your popular Instagram channel or on YouTube? Um, the amount of encouragement that I get every day is humbling. I tell you what, people from Iran were, we're proud of you. We're so, um, they're just so proud of what I'm doing and I'm just, it gives me, supercharges me, you know, I have all this energy and now with all of the encouragement pouring in, I get private messages all the time, DMs all the time, public messages all the time from people all over the world 
and including Iran, people are so encouraging. And it's just like, I felt like I was going to get a lot of pushback first. I was like, my mom literally said, say goodbye to your career. You're <laughs> never going to get patience. You're like, people are going to think you're crazy. And you're just like, first of all, you go and call yourself a vegan, whatever the heck, heck that is. Like my mom was like, are you crazy? She thought I lost it, you know, and then she, now she's vegan, of course. But back then she thought it was, I was like, oh, crazy. Your, your mom is vegan too now. He's now vegan. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> My dad is vegan too at age, age 83. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like the, all of the people around me who said never and they blamed me for being this weirdo who made life difficult for everyone else is now like vegan. It's really interesting. Um, but, you know, my mom is like, forget it. Say goodbye to your career. First, you go vegan like a crazy person. Then you go post bikini pictures of yourself. You're a doctor. <laughs> You're not a model. What are you doing? Like literally everyone was like, say goodbye to your career. It only helped me. I got poor. I got a huge wave of women coming in to see me and to establish with me as their doctor because they said, you know, you motivate me. I look at you and I know it's possible. I've had a child too and I want to go more plant-based. I look at you and I'm like, wow, I can do this too. If she can do it, I can do it. And that was the whole point. But my parents didn't get it. And if I were to stay in, and now they're like, oh, you you put, you put were so smart to do all of that. But <laughs> yes, you have to take chances in life. You have to take risks. And you can't just repeat what your mother did. You can. You're just, there's not going to be growth, in my humble opinion. And I was like, very like, man, you than that. I'm like, once I decide I'm going to do something, I just do it. Even if I feel like other people are not going to like it. If I think it's the right thing, I just do it. And it happens so that if you're thinking it, other people are probably thinking it get to and i literally gained followers because of my lifestyle american iranian and from all over the world uh women especially women it's just been so humbling and beautiful it really is beautiful it is such a, a pleasure to get to talk to you and to learn from you uh, you've spoken so movingly about your son a couple of times uh your teenage son what what does he think of his celebrity doctor mom oh you're so funny thank you i'm hardly a celebrity but um you know he's he's funny i that child is just the love of my life he's such a good kid knock on wood he's like the angel kid you could have he's so so mature he's so smart and so such a cool kid you know and it's funny he's going through his teenage years he looks awkward he's got that big nose and he's got acne and he's got the peach fuzz and he's like mom do i have a big nose and then one day he goes mom you know i don't get it i look at you and you have such a small nose how do i have such a big nose i'm like honey it's called rhinoplasty he's so funny he was genuinely worried like what is it how is it that he got all the big gene nose but like the, the big nose gene and and like i have such a small nose it was cute but i was like you know if you grew up in iran you know we all have nose jobs it's just part of life you get your high school diploma you go to college you get a nose job okay that's how it works but anyway, it's funny. But yeah, he's he's just such a lovely kid. You know, he goes to school and he pulls up my pictures on Instagram and he brags to people about me and uh, who I am and that, you know, um, that he brags that I'm a doctor. He brags that I'm a vegan. And I, I you know, he just, uh, he's such a good hearted kid. Wow. And, so and, and, and is he a vegan as well? No, he's not. It, you know, I, I'm not going to force that upon him. I uh -huh. think he needs to make his own choices. He, he became a vegetarian at age three. And that was his choice. He asked me, where do chicken nuggets come from? And I told him the <laughs> truth. And he's like, I'm not eating chicken anymore or any other animals. That's fine. But he consumes dairy when he's at his dad's house and sometimes when he's at my house when my mom gives it to him. Um, but um, he's not ready. He said, you know, mom, I want to become a vegan eventually, but I'm not ready. And I was like, that's fine, sweetheart. You know, I didn't become a vegan until I was like in my 40s. And you'll get there when you get there. Your journey is your journey. You know, it's hard with food. You have to raise them so they have a healthy relationship with food like if you're too militant about like you can't have cookies you can't have sweets right. then they go to a birthday party and they see cake and they have like 10 slices whereas if you go you can have whatever you want honey there is you don't should not feel restricted like for me i don't really think about drinking alcohol because i don't really love it like 
do I drink? Yeah, once in a while I go out and I want to have a tequila shot with my friends or mm. I want to have a cosmopolitan. But if you tell me, Angie, from today on, you can't have alcohol. The one thing I'm going to have is like, <laughs> right, I'm going right. to have a shot of tequila. Right. Like, that's the one thing I'm going to start that's thinking right. about. That's right. So with my son, I would never tell him, you can't have this. It's like, you'll get there when you get there. You should have a healthy relationship with food, you know? You know, I was just, I was, I was going to say uh, anecdotally, I don't I don't have kids, but I have a, a little French bulldog. And from the time I was a teenager, I worked uh, with dogs. I worked in a dog food uh, place, uh, in a dog grooming place. And we used to go out of our way to try and wean. We, we were considered like this health place for dogs, you know, that uh, we would go, go out of our way to wean people, uh, wean their dogs off of something like Purina because we would say, you know, and we, we kept repeating the mantra that your dog is what your dog eats, you know. And um, it, it, it occurs to me that we think that way about dogs. We know that if you feed the dog a certain way, they're going to have a better coat. They're going to have a better attitude. They're going to have a better life, a longer life. They're not going to have bladder issues, whatever it is. It's exactly the same with humans, right? We're animals as well. Oh, for sure. You are like you are what you eat in combination with your genetics too. But genetics play a, a factor, but you know, environmental factors um, play such a huge role on our health than genetic factors. Like for example, in the case of col colon cancer, only about five to 10% of colon cancer cases are hereditary. The rest is lifestyle, being overweight, cigarettes, smoking, alcohol, drinking, eating uh, processed and red meats, um, so, you know, lack of exercise. So, you know, so much of it is environmental and we are what we eat for sure. It's the same thing with our dogs. Um, with dogs, it's easier to control what they eat. With kids, eh, not so much, you know, because they go to school and their other friends are eating cookies and ice cream. And then you're like, you're like the only bad, the bad mom was like, you can't That's have right. that. And, you know, right. it's so hard. Um, you know, you can't be too strict because then they have, they develop unhealthy relationships with food and they do it behind your back. <laughs> That's right. A final question to you. I'm thinking about you in the car when you were nine years old uh, and your parents in the front seats and you saying, you know what, I'm going to be a doctor. And um, your dad going, Chibache, Hubi, way to go. And your mom saying, I don't know, it's a hard life. I don't know if that's the right thing to do. Um, what, 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 what does your mom say to you these days? Oh, my God, she's so proud of me. She's such a lovely cutie pie. She's just like an overweight Iranian mom who gives, 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 just does anything for me and and the and, and her grandkids. And she's she's very proud of me. My dad is more proud. My mom just she's one of those people who accepts people for who they are. And if I were to go and become anything else, she would have still been proud. Mm. Uh, my dad keeps bragging to Ron, my daughter's a doctor, you know, he does that <laughs> all the time. It's so embarrassing. But, um, you know, she just, uh, she encourages me every day. She helps me every day. She just um, wants me to keep doing what I'm doing because she's proud of what I'm doing. How does she help you every day? Well, um, being a doctor, honestly, a full-time doctor, a full-time business owner, I have my own clinic. And being a mom is quite challenging. So I feel like I'm wearing three hats and self care obviously is very important. So I have so many moving pieces every day, like handling employees and handling patients. And so what she does for me is tremendous. She'll uh, help me with my son, make sure he has clothing, make sure he has food on his ta on the table for him. He's picked up from school. He does his homework. All of that is so wonderful to have i'm lucky that i have my mom and dad's help every day because i don't know how other people do it without any help you know they're paying it forward after their daughter has done so well it that's a it's a it's a great story it is um again not just instructive and insightful but invigorating talking to you i thank you so much for taking the thank time you. today i can't wait to see you in person sometime if you can visit us in canada or we'll see you down there in california congratulations on all the success and thank you for all the information Oh, my pleasure. It's been an awesome pleasure talking to you because I think you're, you know, I've done a lot of interviews. This has been one of my favorites. You're just such a thoughtful person, so caring. And I, I 
really appreciate that you understand like when you describe my childhood it's as if you were there so <laughs> i can tell you care and it's not just about talking about things it's about feeling and putting yourself into that situation and i really appreciate that don't don't let any of this uh lead you to to think that i'm not angry at you for not allowing me to eat kebab and cheese <laughs> but uh <laughs> I'm going to send you some vegan cheese. Yeah, please do. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if this is going to work, but the soy thing is very interesting. You've, you've had, you've already had an impact. I don't know if I can totally give up dairy just yet. I'm going to think about it. I'll definitely consider all of this. It probably will lead me to some changes, but I mean, it's, you know, it's very powerful what you have to say. Um, thank you again. Take care. We'll talk soon. Thank you so much. Good office. Good office. Dr. Angie Saderi is a specialist in gastroenterology and weight loss and an expert in all areas of the digestive system. We reached her in Newport Beach, California today. Right, microphone's back on for Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, and Fabulous Keon. Well, I just really enjoyed that conversation. I really, really appreciate what she does. I appreciate her passion. I appreciate what she was teaching me there. Uh, and I know, let me just say this right now, I know there are going to be people listening. I know because we had some debates even before this episode <laughs> who are going to quibble with her uh studies or say that they disagree or they don't you know who are very possessive and passionate about continue <laughs> continuing to eat their dairy or eat their meat uh absolutely let us know your thoughts you can email us at info at rookmedia.com or post on any of our platforms at the same time if you enjoyed that and you support and agree with dr angie not only should you be following her because she's fabulous but uh also, uh, let us know what you thought about uh, her. I thought there was so much information there, Kian. I saw you yeah. nodding the whole way through it. Uh, yeah. Your thoughts? I I'm gonna give up cheese first of all. Really? I, yeah, oh. cheese. I'm gonna. I've already given up milk because the thought of cow's milk now really, as she says, disgusts me. I've heard the whole mucus thing and ugh. But cheese. The only <clears throat> I eat cheese on pizza, so that's gonna be a tough one. The one thing I cannot give up is meat, man. I it, listen. I love my kubi there, so mm. that's gonna be it. But if that's what it takes to look like Dr. Angie Sadeh. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, it's I see. Like, you know, she looks uh, great. So you she don't looks... care about the animals, actually. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, actually, I will Keon's say. Keon's ethical decision is to look like <laughs> Dr. Angie Sadeh. Hey, it's working. I, like I will her. say, I, I've made plans to, this summer, I'm going to go to a farm and actually see uh -huh. how they, uh, what the process is, because I want to understand. She has a point. You know, we don't consciously think of where our food comes from, That's how right. it's made. So I want to understand it. Mind I you, a free see. run farm. Farm is it might be different from right. the sort of factory farming or the, so that's, that's the, the way difference some of these animals me. are like, treated. Right, I buy foods, you know, based on like I try to buy foods from farms and places that I know where it's coming from and it's clean and you know the animals are treated well. But still, I want to see what happens behind yeah, the scenes. I want to so. see you giving up cheese. That's going to yeah. be interesting. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Captain Reza, are she, you? She made a very strong case. I got to be honest. Going mm -hmm. in, I had a, I was, I kind of had my guards up. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to give up dairy and cheese mm -hmm. and meat and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But she's she's making a lot of sense to me. So it's kind of I'm tickled like it kind of tickles me the idea of maybe giving up meat sticking mm. to chicken for now and yeah. I mean what what makes sense about it in terms of the way um, Dr. Angie presents it is that she's lived it, right? Yeah. So this was her experience. She's sharing it. I don't find her overly proselytizing. Yeah. I don't find her, I find she's she's saying, hey, this is my experience. It's been mm -hmm. great for me. I encourage you as well, but mm -hmm. you know, do whatever you want to do. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I like yeah. that idea. Now, do you think, I'm just asking this for a friend, yeah. but do you think if, uh, do you think that KFC is considered meat? <laughs> no, because no, that's I, really I, 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 Do I have to give that up? Because <laughs> no, no. I don't really actually 
think that's me. Gian, Whatever that is. You <laughs> took the AstraZeneca. For God's sake, <laughs> give up KFC. Fine. No, KFC is because the batter is made of like bread, and that's essentially vegetables that yeah. you're that's eating. So that's you'll right. be fine. That's right. But Whatever is in KFC, it probably isn't As meat. long as the chicken is was emotionally in the right mental yeah. state and was killed and we're eating it, that's all I care. Uh, sh- yes, Kia. I was just going to say, she said it herself, not enough studies have been done to confirm that, for example, meat really is bad for you. I mean, humans have been consuming meats for thousands of years. So that to me, like... Well, she didn't say I, that. I, she she didn't say that. Like, she she actually made the case that it isn't. She certainly made the case that red meat mm. is uh, can can bring on cancer, processed meats especially. Uh, no, no, she was. But but yes, there are different studies that show different yeah, things. Yeah. I I don't know. I mean, I've you know I I think it's pretty hard to make the case for 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 meat uh, beyond lifestyle and mm. how great it tastes and feeling I, I i said to i wanted to ask her that question about feeling good because mm-hmm. i have felt that since i started eating meat right. again um it, not that when i ever eat the kfc or something i say well, that okay. jokingly i do feel like shit afterwards right. but if i ever eat something like that mm-hmm. but you know a a proper you know piece of steak or mm-hmm. a uh, chicken meat. breast or something I yeah. I yeah I don't afterwards feel the yeah. bloating or the discon- yeah. cheese disc- on yeah. the other hand for cheese, me it's yeah. no it does not it doesn't but like my body <sighs> Yeah. I know, but I feel better if I eliminate that. Some so, uh, Gerdu and <laughs> Penny the Tabris. Oh, yeah, no, and some you know what, forget doom. it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Shaya? Uh, actually, what gives me hope is that she gave up on dairy after 40. So oh. I think I have some years to <laughs> so I see. So, yeah. The hope is that you can wait for another five years. Yes, right. and it, it, it will come. <laughs> I love Shia's strategy. But, no, but, but actually... Right. Shia, she, she did that, but she also said her life was miserable before that. I Mine mean, is you not ki- miserable. Well, <laughs> sometimes you're down. Sometimes you're a little sluggish. You know, maybe yeah, a yeah. change in your diet. Yeah, but that's true. Actually. I mean, you could yeah. start by drinking a little less. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, let's, ask, let's ask Dr. Angie if you smoke a, a spliff every day, if that's bad for you. Uh, every day, Shia? She wouldn't that's have given the up most meat. plant-based <laughs> thing you can <laughs> right. He has a point. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, maybe she wouldn't have given up any it's of very this stuff. Plant- Shia is ahead Shia of us already. <laughs> he's already plant-based. That's right. He's plant-based in terms of what he consumes each night. <laughs> Uh, thank you again to Dr. Angie Sadiqi for the time. You know, she was between patients, literally. Yeah. She did that interview. Appreciate that. All right, let's get to the letters of the week. Oh. Oh my God. I really thought this week he wouldn't do it. I thought maybe I, the Pfizer so hope. vaccine <laughs> there was hope inoculated in the him from doing this. <laughs> yeah. All right, so last week on episode 110, Sadoda. Thank you. you know the ambulance oh, yeah, uh, yeah. no the police that's what <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. you know anyway uh, we had Iranian American visual artist illustrator and production designer Mehdad Isfandi on the show he's the art director at Disney and he's responsible for such films as Moana Raya and the Last Dragon and Ralph Breaks the Internet a Disney animation yeah production designer and uh, people love this so, been I, hearing about it all week yeah. and people have, uh, it's gotten thousands of views yeah. and streams and people just love yeah, Mehdad it was super know? Great story. Loved yeah. him. Hope on YouTube we have a username Pad Pad Adab wrote, "What an amazing life story, Mehrdad! You are a role model to the young generation of Iranians who think they're trapped. Your resilience and creativity is beyond belief. Beautiful. Very beautiful. Nice. And then on Instagram we have Anahita wrote, "That was amazing. Love it. Thank you, Jian, for this awesome interview. We're proud of Mehrdad Isvandi. He inspired us." I'm from Ahwaz too. Parcham Ahwaz Hamisha Bolost. Oh. Meaning the flag so of Some a- real Ahwaz represent <laughs> happening there. Yeah. yeah. And then we have uh, Farah Bizan Realtor uh, says, I can't get over your amazing voice and the way you speak. Hope you make it very far. And that's to you, Jean. Oh, I hope I make it very far as well. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Thank yeah. you. Unless they're talking about Captain Reza. I yeah. doubt that very much. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, very doubtful. <laughs> well, as far as it goes. <laughs> as well, last week on episode 109, we had popular Iranian British TV personality, documentarian, and social media influencer Shirin Nasseri on the show. 
on Instagram, we have a Arash Fazilipur wrote, You guys are collectively hilarious. You should add a comedy segment at least on Clubhouse. Kharas <laughs> thingamabob. Hey, that's Khamas <laughs> Kharanat, by the way. That's Arash, in reference to us. Arash John. <laughs> Thank um, you, Arash, for that. And look at that. It's time for the letter of the week. Oh, two weeks ago on episode 108, we had Australian-Iranian founder of Persian Yoga, Kashi Azad, on the show. And uh, 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 Persian Yoga meaning Iranian Pahlavani. Um, so we have a Saba Asadi writing to us. Uh, I, I believe she's from Sydney, Australia. So she writes, just finished listening to the interview with Kashi, who is my master in learning Pahlavani something I've always wanted to learn when I was in Iran, but wasn't allowed to as a woman. Kashi allowed me to pick up our ancient martial art and finally get access to this knowledge. The first episode of Rook I've listened to is Farinaz Lariz, who's another master of mine. These two people changed my life and helped me thrive in many different levels. Much respect to Master Farinaz and Master Kashi. I'm grateful for them in my life and all that they're constantly teaching me. Wow. Beautiful. Nice. Yeah. Very beautiful. Okay. Yeah, I'll clap for that too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it's kind of amazing that this person has uh, had the had the pleasure of being taught by both Kashi and Fairy Nose. Absolutely. Yeah. Fairy Nose is in Vancouver now. I mean, I, maybe they know. Maybe online is what she meant. She's or maybe in Iran. Maybe. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Saba, for that. And thank you to everybody who writes uh, into us. Thank you, Keon June, for putting together the uh, Letters of the Week. Uh, thank you, Captain Reza. Thank you, Gravy Shia. This is full time for Rook for today. Remember to check out our website, rookmedia.com, for all of our episodes, our guests. Our extras, everything is there at rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week. Producer Susan, Ponta the artist, thoughtful Nagin, the fabulous Keon, Savvy Rohan, Ahai Merthod, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. And you can become a patron of Rook for five or ten bucks a month by going to our website, rookmedia.com, and pressing on support us. See you Thursday with Rana Mansour as our feature guest. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. In the meantime, Mizun Bashin. <laughs>